You know what you're doing? Good morning, and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We are so glad you are here. This is a day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
you've got. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We proclaim the message of the cross. This is the wisdom and the power of God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of blazing light, through your power of the cross, you shattered our darkness, scattered the fears that bind us, and setting us free to live as your children. Give us courage and conviction that we may joyfully turn and follow you into new adventures of faithful service, led by the light that shines through Jesus Christ, our Savior.
we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin before God and neighbor. God of glory, we confess that we have not sought your face. You call us to follow Jesus, but we are afraid to walk in faith. You call us to be one in Christ, but we continue to quarrel and fight. Forgive us, give us grace, as you have sent the Savior to us. Send us out as witnesses to show the wonder of your love. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting unto everlasting. The psalmist declares, as far as the east is from the west, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Grace to you and peace in our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. We're glad that you're here. Friends, if uh, you would take the friendship pad and fill that out and pass it down the row and back, that you might know the names of those seated around you to greet each other at close of worship. If you're visiting with us, I want to say a special word of welcome. If you're interested in learning how you might live out your life of discipleship as part of this congregation, at close of worship, there will be uh, somebody to answer questions and welcome you, and I believe the place now is up front. That's uh, by the cross, maybe, but the cross won't be there because the cross goes away. But over in this corner, no, excuse me, on the baptismal side, there we go, where the, uh, wh where the piano is, and there's no room. Thank you all. Great. <laughs> That is just a metaphor through which the season we live. Donovan uh, wants me to remind you that next week is our annual congregational meeting. It'll be at 10 o'clock between services. We won't have Sunday school classes, so everybody can be here. 
we need to have 200 people for a quorum. So you who are at the late service need to come early, and the folks at the early service need to stay late, and uh, we will have a chance to conduct the church's business at that time. Donovan, do you want to tell us about the yep? Right, yeah, so we don't know exactly what we're doing all the time. Uh, we will meet, uh, if you're a prospective member, would like to hear more about the church, right over here, uh, by what will soon be the last time we'll see these bathrooms. There's still bathrooms over here, but this is the last Sunday for that. Next Sunday, out that door and down the long hallway, and good luck. Um, <laughs> wanted to let you know, there's a lot of work going on. It's all pretty cool. Uh, the floor and the... Um, the gym floor is finished. You can look at it from the top floor of the children's wing, but please do not travel on it uh, because they got to let all that set up. And if you walk across it, it'll only cost us $10,000 to redo it all. So please uh, don't do that. If you'd like to take a tour of the building, uh, we can set tours up, but don't go wandering around during construction or anything like that because we, we don't want to do funerals during this time as, as well. So uh, please remember just... Uh, be careful, stay over here, read the signs, don't go past the things that say don't enter, that kind of thing. I know you will. So thank you very much. The Lord be with you. Amen. Illumine your word, O God, by the power of the Spirit. That same Spirit that inspired it and preserved it until its reading today. Illumine and inspire us as we hear it. That in hearing we might follow and lead lives that would give you glory. For it's in Christ I pray. Our first text this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. This is writing before the fall. It's a word of hope and vision. Beginning at chapter 9, verse 1. Hear the word of God. But there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time, God will make glorious the way of the sea and the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors, you have broken as on the day of Midian. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Singing for the Lord is alive. We are singing for the Lord is alive. 
The gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses 12 through 23. Hear the word of God. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali, that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulon, land of Naphtali, and the road of by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogue and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. 
The word of the Lord. Well, life has its detours. This morning, you've already been shut out of your parking space. You've had to climb over a chain link fence. You've had to walk a half a mile to get to worship. There's no coffee, and yet you're here. You're a gritty bunch, the few, the proud, Westminster. <laughs> Life has its detours. The word heard often in the new members class is, well, I'm Catholic and she's Church of Christ and we ended up here. Life has its detours. Life is full of them. Any time where we have to back up, turn around when the stock market takes a tumble, when the job falls through, there's a spot on the x-ray, the divorce seems like it's in the works. Someone shuts you out when you thought what was going to be doesn't happen. And what you never imagined would ever happen does. It's a detour. Our lives bump around, they ricochet off of walls, turn-by-turn -turn navigation is no longer available. So it is. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. That just sounds to me like a detour. It sounds to me that even when you're the son of God, even when you have the power of the Almighty, life has its detours. Matthew wants us to know that from the very beginning of his gospel. Chapter 1, verse 1 begins that great genealogy, story after story of lives that had to take detours. None of those lives in that great genealogy went swimmingly. You have Abraham and Sarah who at 105 are going to PTA meetings. That, that's a detour. You, you got David covering up his sinful tracks. That's a detour. The widow Ruth saying to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. A detour, story after story, detour after detour. We stumble through the characters until we arrive at that story of Christmastide. The story of Joseph, who finds himself with a fiance who's pregnant and he had nothing to do with it. That's a detour. I know what I'll do. I'll divorce her quietly. A detour. And then guess what? Another detour. An angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, take Mary as your wife. Detour. And then Jesus is born. And guess what? A detour. Because Herod's going to kill all the infants. And so Mary and Joseph and the babe, they have to find the airport and take the first flight to Egypt. Detour, refugees on the run. And so the story goes and goes. And the next we hear a voice crying out in the wilderness. And it sounds kind of like a joke, really. John says, make his paths straight. <laughs> There's no straight line with God. No straight line for Jesus. For example, if we have a baptism here at the church with an infant, what happens next? Church is over with, you take your pictures by the baptismal font, and then you go home where you have chicken salad and grandma's uh, vanilla pudding, right? I mean, that's, that's the line. But for Jesus, after he was baptized, what happens? The Spirit of God drives him into the wilderness where he meets the devil. That's a welcome start to ministry, don't you think? It's not supposed to be that way. No one starts their career wanting to meet the devil. I remember when I became ordained, and the next week I show up for work, Monday, got my blazer on and my tie, and I go to work, and my first meeting is on the playground with sippy cups and kids crawling all over me, sticky kids. It's the summertime, it's 90 degrees outside, and we're doing vacation Bible school planning. And Amy Sharp, I can still hear her voice, 
who was chair of the vacation Bible school that summer, said to me, Donovan, can you do a puppet show? <laughs> and there in the wilderness, the devil spoke to me. <laughs> the devil whispered in my ear and, and, and said to me, they don't even know who you are, do they? By golly, you graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary. You know words like eschatology. <laughs> you took Greek and Hebrew. And they want you to do a puppet show? That's where you beat the devil. And so you know what I did? I went back to the church. And I got on my knees and lifted my head to the heavens and raised two hands with puppets on them. Hey, Fireball. Hey, Lisa. <laughs> Princeton. <laughs> Jesus is the Son of God. Jerusalem, I suspect, is right there. I don't know. You know, John is baptizing people in the Jordan in the beginning of Matthew. He's all of Jerusalem comes out to see him. I just think that Jesus gets done with his baptism and Jerusalem's right there, big lights, big city. But then when John was arrested, Jesus withdrew to Galilee. I don't know, it just sounds like Jesus is maybe running a little scared, I don't know. Sounds like the powers that be put a little fear into his soul. It sounds like defeat. After all, do you know where Galilee is? Do you know where Galilee is? Let me tell you where Galilee is. If you go to downtown Nashville and then you get out on the interstate and go 40 west and you travel to Memphis, which is about three hours away, it just feels like five and a half hours, but it's, it's only three. And then you go through Memphis and over that bridge across the river, and you land in a land, you know what that's called? Some people call it Arkansas. It's, it's not Arkansas. That's Galilee. Now, I said that at 8.30, and I got some feedback from some folks in Arkansas. <laughs> it's just an illustration, folks. Um, and if you're from Arkansas this morning, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm really sorry. Um, <laughs> Look, I'm from Iowa. Iowa is northern Galilee. That's what, it's just, it's really nowhere. Nobody says, let me get in the car and go to Galilee. It's not a place you go to. But that's what happens. Life happens. And the powers that be arrested John. And Jesus goes to Galilee. The ways of God are never easy. The ways of God are never straight. If I were Jesus, I don't think I would have wanted to go to Galilee. I would have gone to the population centers. I would have gone to Jerusalem and then Alexandria and then Ephesus and Rome. Jesus withdrew to Galilee, a place where there is more sheep than people. But here's the thing. When you find yourself in Galilee, and it seems like the end of the world, it's not. For the gospel reminds us again and again that when life takes a detour, it does not mean that life is over. It means life is different. For hear the good news. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. You see, the places you and I never dreamed our lives would end up, even in those places, light shines, the light of God. Jesus takes a detour to a place where time for God, and then he sees two guys in a boat. He probably smells them before he sees them. Two guys in the middle of a lake, in the middle of nowhere, and he says to those fishermen, I choose you. Those two people touched by the voice of God. Wow, who would have ever guessed? 
On Thursday of this week, I was invited to the Salvation Army Community Center. It was a rainy day. And on Thursday, I had a lot on my mind, just a lot of stuff going on. And I was getting a tour of the facility and seeing the rooms for the, the families and the men, and, and uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on. I saw all the apartments and the transitional housing, great stuff. But I wasn't really there. I mean, my mind was elsewhere, and I knew it. I tried to focus, but you know how it is when you're just, you're just kind of going through the motions. Well, somewhere in between going to the computer center and the gymnasium, our tour stopped. And I was directed by the gentleman leading our tour to a photograph that was in the hallway. As I, my mind's eye remembers it, it, it was kind of on a cardboard cutout place, and it was like a newspaper article with a photograph of a, of a gentleman who, who looked a lot like um, Captain Kangaroo with, with glasses. And if you don't know who Captain Kangaroo is, I'm sorry. Because uh, we could all use a little Captain Kangaroo, I think, right now in this country. We all just need to chill out a little bit. Well, the man who was showing us around there stopped at that photograph of that man who looked like Captain Kangaroo in my mind. His, the man touring us was named Carlos Lowe. And he shared about that picture. And he said, that man right there in that picture, when I was a child, I grew up in this neighborhood. And that man picked me out of all the kids and said to me, Carlos, you're the chosen one. And right when Carlos was sharing that story, his voice cracked. And he apologized for getting a little emotional. But it was like he was hearing that voice again for the first time. Carlos, you're the chosen one. And I know nothing about Carlos. I, I suspect that he's probably like the rest of us, part saint, part sinner. But here's my guess. Carlos recognized of all the fish of the sea, that he was caught. He was recognized. Someone values him and knows that his life has a purpose. Carlos, you're the chosen one. Changed his life. And today I suspect that Carlos works with 80 or 90 or 100 kids there in that gym who come to that place each and every day, kids whose lives are so much different than our kids' lives, but kids who hurt like we hurt, kids who laugh like we laugh, kids who get sad like we get sad, kids who need hope like we need love and hope. 80, 90, 100 kids and here's my guess, and it's just a guess. I don't know if it's true or not, but I suspect Carlos probably pulls one of those kids aside every now and then and says their name and says, you know what? You're the chosen one. It's only a guess. because I think he said it to me. Do you know what it's like to be called? To have your name called. To have a purpose. If you don't know what it's like, listen. If you, do, if you do have a, a memory that's about as foggy as that black and white photograph, bring it back up. Share it. See if your voice doesn't catch when you tell that story of, I remember, I remember when God called me
Don't let that story grow old for you. Blow the dust off of it. Hear that voice again over and over and over again, and you'll see that when you're in the land of Galilee, in that land that people walk in darkness, you'll see oh, hope. You'll see light. It's not a land forgotten. It becomes holy ground. And holy ground can happen on a gymnasium floor at a Salvation Army Center off Dickerson Pike. Holy ground can happen when you're on your knees in a fellowship hall with your hands raised and two furry creatures doing a puppet show. Holy ground can happen when you're skin and bones, because I've seen it more than enough. Skin and bones, and yet the gospel can be proclaimed from those skin and bones. And light shines. It can be proclaimed at your home. Turn your workspace into holy ground. And if you're in traffic and stuck in a jam, good news. You have a detour in your life. And it only leads to light. And God learned that John was arrested. His life took a detour. And we're the better for it. Because God is with us. Emmanuel. remain standing and say what we believe using the affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. Christ calls us to be disciples, informing his people and sending them into the world. Jesus called individuals to be disciples. They were to share the joy of his companionship, to understand and obey his teachings, and to follow him in life Confess that Christians today are called to discipleship. My life shared with Christ, shaped by Christ, is God's undeserved gift to each of us. It is also Christ's demand upon every one of us, never perfectly fulfilled by anyone else, forgiven by God, and supported by brothers. 
I would remind you that immediately following the worship in the chapel, there is a, a service of uh, prayer for wholeness. And if you would like some particular prayer uh, with one of the pastors, please uh, go in there. The Lord be with you.
Fisherman Peter on the sea, drop your net for and follow me, and follow me. Fisherman Peter on the sea, drop your net for and follow me, follow me. Drop your net for and follow me, and follow me. Fisherman Peter on the sea, on the sea. Give thanks to the Lord our God. God of majesty and life, you hold the whole world in your hands. So we give you our great praise that in Jesus Christ all the people may see your glory. We thank you for revealing Jesus to be your Son and for claiming our lives in baptism to be the glad disciples. By your Spirit, Us and all we have to be useful in your service. God. God. 
your life's on a detour right now, good news, you're in a very good space. You're in a very good space for sharing the gospel. So go tell the good news. Go knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit are with us all. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.